I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest, Jesse Felder. And I am really interested, after 15 years of being a member, how you do use stock charts. So I'm going to let you take it away. I'm going to be watching closely. Um, yeah, you know, it's uh, for me, I have to preface this. This is this is my dashboard here we're looking at. But I have to preface this. I, I'm a, a long-term investor, and I have been since the beginning of my career. I, I worked at Bear Stearns and co-founded a, a a uh, hedge fund in, in LA and, and did that for a while. And it was about 15 years ago that I started studying technical analysis and kind of adding that tool to my toolbox um, and started adding some macro also. So I have a longer time frame probably than most of, of you guys, Aaron and, and Tom, and probably most of your, your watchers too, your viewers. Um, but uh, for me, you know, adding technical analysis to my process to, uh, has been very, very valuable for me. And so I'll just go through um, some of the charts that I look at on, on a regular basis. This one down here is probably, these are totally out of order. And, <laughs> but uh, you can just get a feel for some of the indicators and things that I'm looking at. Tom and I we were talking about this one before, uh, before we went on the air. And this is basically just the blue line uh, is the difference between the U.S., Treasury yield, 10 year treasury yield, and the German yield. And you can see it's very highly correlated to the SP 500. Um, and to me, that just makes perfect sense. The more attractive our assets are generally relative to the rest of the world, more money's going to flow into dollars and into our stock market and junk bonds and those kinds of things. So that's one thing I pay attention to, just to the general direction of the broad stock market. Um, this is a chart of just 10-year treasury yields. And then the indicator at the bottom is Bollinger Band width. And for me, um, when I see those Bollinger Bands widen dramatically, that is an indicator to me of an impulse move. So if you study Elliott Wave theory, impulse moves are generally in the direction of the prevailing trend. And so when I look for these big impulse type moves to kind of just let me know what is the overall trend in this market. So this is a 10 year, even longer, 12, 13 year chart of 10 year treasury yields. And you can see through 2008, 2011, we had these impulse moves down in yields. Uh, and then in 13, we had a strong impulse move higher. We had another one in late 16 after the presidential election. And so far yields have been coming down over the past you know, since since last fall, um, but I'm not seeing it so so far as an impulse move. So to me, the trend is still is still up in interest rates until we see a, a very strong move to the downside. Um, and then when you look at just the long term trend of the ten year yield, you could see this this downtrend was broken to the upside and is now being tested from above. To me, that's kind of textbook trend change type of action. Same thing in the two year yield. Um, this next chart is uh, basically the ratio of the bank, banks index to the S&P 500 along with the yield curve. And so I remember I was, uh, I gave an interview in late 16 when the, the banks uh, just exploded higher, you know, after the election on deregulatory kind of hopes. Um, and the yield curve really wasn't supporting that move. And, and since then, over the last you know, two years plus, banks have been underperforming and it's all you know, directly related to the yield curve. Um, banks make money on net, net interest margin uh, when there's no interest margin to be made. <laughs> That's not great for the banking sector. Um, hey, hey, Jesse. Yeah. I got a question uh, going back to that bank chart. Um, yes. Is this a time, do you think? I mean, you were just pointing out that the 10 year treasury yield broke that longer term downtrend, came back and, and kind of back tested that line that it broke out above. Same with the two year. So, do you think that this is a situation where we're likely to see those rates start to turn back up? And the fact that we've, we've got such a narrow spread now on the yields, that is this the time maybe to be jumping into banks, do you think? You know, for me, um, yes, I do think banks are are undervalued relative to, to the rest of the market. Um, I have stayed away from bank stocks for a, a lot of my career, just um, because their financials are so difficult to get a handle on their their black boxes. But to the extent that the the yield curve here is potentially bottoming and starting to widen again, um, that should be bullish for financials generally. I I personally like um, Annaly. Uh, capital management, they're a mortgage REIT, and uh, they've they've kind of suffered along with the those uh, the bank stocks, um, 
And I think, you know, I, I like, I'm more comfortable with their financials. <laughs> so um, this is a chart of the dollar and the long bond. And you can see how, you know, we were talking about how the difference in yields between us and Germany, you can see with, you know, uh, that makes our bond market more attractive. And you can see how bonds and the dollar are, are pretty highly correlated as well. It's just, you know, money flows here because of, because of that yield disparity. Uh, and it's and it's uh, bullish for the dollar. It's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. Is the dollar up because people are buying bonds, or bonds up because people want to move into dollars? Um, doesn't really matter either way. But it's important to pay attention to those dynamics. Um, this is just a simple breadth thrust indicator. I think I got from Ned Davis. Um, it's when you get 90% of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average. That's usually a pretty good bullish signal. And you can see I highlighted the green areas. At the beginning of those periods and then when you get back down below 20 percent too, this kind of i look at as the end of that breadth thrust we had one back you know very early this year we had one in early 16 and uh you know that to me is something i, I pay attention to here is the uh uh the uh difference between the premium and discount on the, the Central Fund of Canada, which is now the Sprott Physical Gold and Silver Trust. To me, this is a sentiment indicator towards precious metals. When the, when the, uh, the, uh, central, the uh, closed end fund trades at a, a premium, you know, people are really bullish on, on the precious metals. And when it trades at a discount, people are bearish. So that's something to pay attention to as a sentiment signal. Um, you guys mentioned Mosaic was upgraded. To me, this is really interesting. So this is a chart of essentially the FXI, the, the China Chinese ETF, along with Mosaic. And you can see these have been very highly correlated until the last few years. And still the price movements are generally in the same direction. But to me, I look at this over a long period of time and I go either China's overvalued or Mosaic is undervalued um, because they should trade together. And when you look at um, Mosaic's valuation, over a long term, you can see this stock is really cheap, and there's been some interesting insider buying. So this is really kind of my bread and butter. I look for things where there's technically looks interesting. Um, it's very cheap, and the insiders are telling me I'm right <laughs> to be bullish on this thing. So you have the CFO just bought 100 grand worth of stock um, early last month. So that's something that that I'm paying attention to. Is, uh, Mosaic. Um, this is just the copper to gold ratio usually uh, is a good indicator of which direction um, interest rates are moving. To me, it's been interesting here that we have a new low in the 30-year yield and the copper to gold ratio has not made a new low. To me, that's potentially a bullish divergence for interest rates. Um, but when you see on this next chart, they generally move pretty closely together. And so that's something I pay attention to from a fundamental standpoint of what, what way are, are yields headed. Um, this is just the Dow Transports and Industrials. Here's one of my favorite charts of gold. And to me, it looks like this downtrend that started in 2011-12 um, broke out in 17. This, this sharp rally in 16 was even kind of held back by this downtrend line, broke out above it. And now we're just waiting for this 1350 level, which to me, I mean, you could kind of look at this as somewhat of a, a st very strange looking head and shoulders bottom. Um, but this breakout over 1350 is what everybody's watching. And, uh, I think it probably breaks above that this year for some of my fundamental things that I look at, but, uh, monitoring that is going to be important for, for things I do. This is just the difference between us and German yields. Um, another way to look at it, um, back to gold, uh, to this Bollinger band width analysis, we can see that. The, they haven't been as narrow, the Bollinger Bands, as they are today, essentially since mid-1999, early 1999. They got mid last year, they got really narrow again, and late late last year. And now we're back to this super narrow width. To me, this, this tells me that we, we could be on the cusp of a big move. It doesn't say up or down, obviously, but uh, you know, I, I, to me, it tells me that uh, things can't stay this calm for this, for, for this long, um, typically. Um, this is the gold to S&P 500 ratio. Uh, this next chart might help to make more sense of it, but essentially it's been in a downtrend for quite some time. Um, but late last year in the fourth quarter sell-off, gold in relation to the S&P 500 looks like it broke out and is now showing some strength again. 
I monitor this ratio because there's times to own gold and times to own stocks, and usually they don't overlap. Um, usually, you, know, you look from 1970 to 1980, you wanted to own gold. It wasn't a great time to own stocks. And then from 80 to 2000, it was a 20-year period. You wanted to own stocks, not gold. Um, from 2000 to 2012, you definitely wanted to own gold and not stocks. And since 2012, you really wanted to be a, a buyer of stocks and not gold. And just the direction of this ratio can help you understand um, when it's a good time to own one or the other. And so for me, if this uh, you know, uh, ratio breaks above this 10-month moving average, that's a potentially another bullish kind of trend-following signal for gold in relation to or versus the stock market. Uh, this is the ratio of gold, or sorry, the gold mining stocks to gold. And we can see they haven't been this cheap relative to the precious metal since 2000. So to me, that's very interesting from a you know, value investor standpoint um, that you know, gold is, is pretty hated or has been for the last few years, but the gold mining stocks are probably even more so. But this ratio is also breaking its downtrend, potentially signaling that uh, gold stocks are going to outperform the metal going forward. Um, this is a gold indicator that I got from Tom McClellan. Um, Tom's a friend of mine, and this is one of my, my favorite indicators that he has. And it basically just highlights a very interesting oversold indicator when you get you know, RSI below 30 and the five-day rate of change below you know, close to 3% down. Um, that's a signal that gold's potentially ready to reverse. It doesn't always work, like we saw late last year. It didn't work so well. Um, but when you get these things lining up, a lot of these gold rallies have come after it's become oversold like that. Another gold indicator is, to me, something I've been watching is tips broke out um, this year and exploded higher. T tips and gold usually are pretty highly correlated. So to me, that was potentially a good omen for gold bulls that with, with tips breaking out, gold should potentially follow. So it has yet to do so, but uh, still paying attention to that one. Um, this is a buy signal from a guy named Cam Hui, a uh, humble student on Twitter. He basically has this uh, trifecta, which is something I pay attention to. He usually marks good bottoms. It's a, you know, a VIX, trend, and uh, breadth indicator. When you get all three um, over these levels, it seems to be uh, a good buy signal. This is my sentiment, one of my main sentiment charts, essentially combines the right X ratio and the National Association of Investment Managers um, investment positioning. And so you can see when these things, you get these good downdrafts here in both of these ratios, like we did in late 15, early 16. That's a pretty good contrarian signal. We got somewhat in late 18, still pretty good signal. But um, I think if you're looking for these longer term type of bottoms, it helps to see this type of capitulation on the part of both of these uh, managers. Um, emerging markets, very interesting chart, um, goes back to 2007, this very important area. It's hard to believe that these things have been trading around the same area for 12 years. Um, but to me, potentially, um, we're looking at uh, a, a very bullish kind of basing over the last um, 12 to 18 months. That could be very good for emerging markets going forward if they can hold above 40 again. Um, another chart of the right X ratio, uh, very interesting to me to see that in 2017, 18, we saw the ratio finally go back and eclipse the highs that it made in 2000, which, you know, people say there isn't bullishness in this market. Well, when you look at this, it's hard to, hard to claim that, that, uh, people are maybe not talking bullishly, but they're positioned at least at right X more bullishly, uh, or they at least were recently, they're positioned more bullishly than they were at the peak of the dot-com mania. Um, this is kind of an interesting chart, more of a macro um, feel for this one. It's basically the ratio of Dollar Tree to Macy's. And it's more of kind of an economic indicator, I think, uh, that when we see this ratio explode higher, uh, that usually is a precedes recession. We saw Dollar Tree surge relative to Macy's in 2000. That was a good recession indicator. Again, in 2008, you saw Dollar Tree surge relative to Macy's again. And since 16, really, um, late 15 or, or 2016. And some people consider that uh, an industrial recession. We had ISM contracting and, and some things. We, and then 2017, and again, uh, over the last 
six months, nine months or so, we've seen this ratio just exploding higher, which to me suggests economic weakness potentially going forward. Um, this is just the ratio of small caps to large cap stocks. Um, when this ratio diverges from price, to me, that's a, that's a good breadth warning. Uh, more right X charts, I'll just skip over those. This is another interesting breadth, breadth chart that I pay attention to. It's essentially the ratio of the equal weight S&P to the, to the market cap weighted S&P. Um, and I, I find this interesting because, uh, you know, generally the smaller cap stocks should be at least as strong as, as the big cap stocks. When they're not, when they're falling off, that's, that's an important breadth warning to me. And you just overlay a trend indicator on this and you can see periods uh, of when breadth is weak is generally not great for, for the broad stock market. This is a chart I, I shared on my blog in um, 2009, back in March of 2009. It's very interesting that, you know, on a non-logarithmic scale, um, stocks came back to test this uptrend line that dates back to 82, tested an 87 crash, and then right there, but that also coincided with the 61.8% Fibonacci retracement of this entire bull market gain. So from whatever it was, 100 to 1,500, we came back to 666, and that was almost exactly the perfect Fibonacci retracement in almost exactly a 50% um, extension in time uh, of that period. So this is kind of another chart I'm looking at that lately that's related to that. This is just price to earnings ratio, silver to gold ratio. Silver hasn't been this cheap relative to gold since 1993. It's another kind of interesting sentiment signal, I think, towards the precious metals. To me, these, this is another chart that's very important to me that I, I look at is when I see new price highs made in the S&P, I want to see price highs made in bond market risk appetites. I want to see it also in sector risk appetites. You were talking about this, Tom. And also, I want to see new lows in the VIX. Because when you see these three things diverge from price, it's a, it's a pretty good warning uh, about what's going on in the market. So you see bond market risk appetites. Essentially, this LQD to IEF is a very good proxy for spreads. So when this is going down, spreads are widening. And that's a sign of risk aversion in the, in the corporate bond market. Um, and you can see you know, through these periods where we've had times where S&Ps made new highs and these things have showed increasing risk aversion instead of risk acceptance, it's been a pretty good warning signal longer term for the stock market. And we've seen that again last, last fall. Um, and even at the new highs the S&P made, uh, bond market risk appetites, sector risk appetites, and uh, the VIX were not able to confirm those, those recent highs in the S&P. Um, and also, this is just that same breadth chart. We've seen that breadth, according to the equal weight S&P, has been really lagging um, during over the past two years, really, maybe 18 months in the stock market, which to me is an is underlying warning signal. This is just a trend in the advanced decline line. Um, this is another interesting chart that uh, about a year ago, Stan Druckenmiller gave an interview where he was talking about why he went heavily short the stock market in late 2000. And he said he took a break from the market. Obviously, he, he's talked about this. He made a very famous mistake in, in very the peak of the dot-com mania, recovered all of his shorts and went long and the, right the day the market topped and uh, lost, lost a bunch of money and, and then covered or, or sold all of his, uh, sold out and basically took a vacation. <laughs> and he came back a couple months later and he said, I have to go short this market. Um, and what he was looking at was interest rates, oil, and the dollar had all been rising. Um, into that 2000, mid-2000 period. And he said that was a very, you know, um, strong recipe for falling earnings. And so it was something I wrote about um, last summer was, when, you know, when he gave that interview and said, we look at what yields, oil, and the dollar have done over the last few years. They've all gone up again. And what are we looking at right now? It's another earnings recession. I think uh, second quarter earnings are expected to decline. First quarter earnings, I think, were slightly up. Um, but when you look at other leading indicators for earnings, semiconductor sales, all these kinds of things, are all pointing to another earnings recession similar to what we had in, uh, after 2000. Um, this is just an oversold indicator um, that, I, that uh, Investec uses. It's a very long-term thing when you, know, when you get oversold on this 
uh, 18 month RSI. It's a very good buy signal typically. Um, here's a shorter term oversold indicator. It's basically the percent of stocks trading below their 50 day or above the 50 day moving average or above the 200 day moving average. When you get both of these down to about 10 and 20%, it's a pretty reliable buy signal. Um, this is another chart that I've been looking at. This is the ratio of S&P 500 to the world. And we can see the US stock market has done incredibly well versus the rest of the world during this bull market. Um, most, a lot of these foreign stock markets have been in bear markets since then. They have not overcome their 2007 highs. Uh, the S&P 500 has, this almost looks like a parabolic type of move to me uh, in the S&P 500 versus the world. And if it's starting to break down, um, it could signal that it's time to spend, spend some more time in overseas equity markets. Very, very clear uptrend um, here. And so, you know, some people might want to wait for this lower trend line to break would be, a, I think, probably a clear signal. It's time to start buying Germany and Japan and, and whatnot. Um, it's just another oversold signal here. Um, this is an interesting uh, indicator from uh, Charlie uh, Bellello and uh, uh, his his his. Uh, co-conspirator they uh they wrote a paper on the lumber to gold ratio and how it's a very good indicator for um stocks we've seen lumber to gold you know plunged the ratio plunged into negative rate of change territory uh last summer and that was a very good leading indicator for weakness in stock prices again we saw this thing plunge start plunging in april again which has been a good good tell as to you know what's gonna what's going on with stocks and it was a good leading indicator towards uh what we should expect in may this is the other fibo chart i was talking about um to me uh this is kind of almost the opposite of what we were looking at at that 2009 low which is we've had a you know 6.3 year strong bull market from 2009 till mid 15 um we're essentially right now at the 1.618 price extension and the 1.618 time extension of that move, of that six year move. Um, to me, that would be a, a pretty, and, and I first highlighted this chart back in January of 18 and stocks have struggled to overcome this important Fibonacci extension level since that time. So to me, this is a very interesting potential turning point. I also manually count um, DeMarc sequential and combo indicators um, by hand on the charts. And it was also interesting that late in 17, I think it was fourth quarter 17, we had a quarterly to mark sequential sell signal that lined up very, very well with this, this FIBO chart. Um, to go along with the, the foreign stock market idea, um, this is a chart of the Nikkei. You can see this downtrend. I mean, Nikkei peaked in 1990 uh, and is still down, what, I mean, almost half 50% from that from that peak. Uh, but there's this important downtrend line that was broken to the upside in 2015, tested in 16, almost perfect, you know, uh, trend reversal type of action. And now it's, you know, moved to new highs and you probably draw a little support level here too at 20,000, potentially bullish for um, the Nikkei going forward. Um, this is the semiconductors. This is one of my larger short positions right now. I'm, I'm, I'm a long short investor we managed a long short hedge fund um so I, I own certain things and i'm sure things against that semiconductors are one of the stock uh, sectors i'm short right now and you look at we had a uh, a monthly demark sequential sell signal earlier this year and a huge divergence in money flow at these these new highs uh in the semis when you look at momentum too there's going to be a momentum divergences um michael oliver is another friend of mine who had does some very interesting momentum structural uh, analysis and uh, when you look at semiconductors from a momentum standpoint too the momentum is really starting to wane they're also extremely highly valued hey hey jesse yeah when you're looking at an etf like that the smh uh do you pay any attention to the components uh like intel being the number one um stock that's that's within that uh, smh is that does that concern you at all as to which stocks are in that or do you strictly follow 
your no, I, I absolutely do. I mean, so I didn't like the fact that Qualcomm, you know, is a large component in there. Qualcomm is probably a, a stock that's on the cheaper side of things. But then, you know, NVIDIA became a huge weight in, in uh, the SMH last year. And I shorted NVIDIA separately outside of this um, because it became such incre- so incredibly overvalued. I mean, I think the stock traded... Um, you know, seven, eight times sales at the peak of the dot com mania. It got up to like 15 times sales last year, which to me tells me, you know, the thing is more crazily overvalued than it was at the peak of the dot com mania. That's something that um, once momentum, this is why I started adding technicals, once momentum and thing, these start, things start telling me that it's, it's uh, you know, a better opportunity to try and short it, momentum's waning, um, that, then that's something that I'll, I would look to, to take advantage of. Okay. Um, here's a, an indicator that I developed a couple of years ago. It's essentially correlation between the S&P and the VIX. And I was looking at this a few years ago and saying, you know, the, the VIX and the S&P should not move in the same direction. And when they do, it's usually a sign of a potential trend change, at least short term. Um, and you can see this one I highlighted uh, back in, in like May 1st, April 30th. We had the 10-day correlation between the VIX and the S&P just shot up. And this is basically, it's, you know, investors pushing S&P prices up, but also pushing the prices of options up, which really shouldn't happen. Um, and so that's probably a sign of growing risk aversion, like some of the other indicators that I look at. Uh, and, and like I said, it doesn't always work, that, but but uh, it's, it's a pretty good, you know, red flag uh, for those types of things. And then this chart is long-term chart of interest rates. And when you see rates surging up, uh, this is a chart I, I got from Mehul Daya, who um, is a, writes for one of the big banks. Uh, it usually coincides with some type of a crisis. Uh, we see um, interest rates surge up in 87, led up to the crash, Great Bond mac- Massacre in 94. Dot-com mania peak had interest rates you know, surging into that. And since 2016, we've had a pretty good surge in interest rates that potentially you know, causes problems. The rise in the risk-free rate of return is usually what causes problems. You know, when investors go, wait a second, I can get two and a half without taking any risk. Why should I, you know, buy a junk bond that's giving me four and a half? Um, and, and so this rising interest rate environment is something, that, something interesting to pay attention to also. And then finally, this is just a Zweig breadth thrust um, indicator, uh, similar to the other one, the, the Ned Davis one that I, that I indicated. So that's pretty much my main chart book that I go through on a, a daily, if not at, at least a weekly basis to look for interesting developments, trends in the markets. Hey, um, we did have a question that came in earlier about the breadth thrust and what it's telling you. And I saw you just finished on that one. I mean, what are you, are you gleaning anything from these uh, the charts on breadth? Well, I mean, the thing with the breadth thrust is, is it's a very good signal when you get a breadth fr- thrust that it's going, price is going to continue in that direction for a period of time, for several months. Um, but that breadth thrust, those breadth thrusts that we had, let me go back to this last one here. You know, this was back in early January. So, um, you know, you, you just never know how long because you know, we went from, so Zweig breadth thrust is from below 0.4 to above 6.15 um, uh, on within 10, 10 trading days. So it's just this, this little short move right here. Um, it's a very bullish signal and it obviously carried through through April. Um, but I don't think there's, there's much to glean from it uh, beyond that um, because you just don't know how long they're gonna last. If I go back to the other, the other one, the way I use, um, as like a disconfirmation is if stocks were to get down back to this 20%, uh, only 20% of S&P 500 stocks trading below, or uh, sorry, above their 50 day moving average, that would kind of be a signal that this thrust is, is over. Okay. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, you know, I guess from what you're saying and from what I'm, I'm kind of hearing from you, I would say that you are overall pretty bearish at this point, U S equities. I am. I am. And I I think that's, you know, a few reasons. One, when you look at, um, you know, things like the price to sales ratio, the the Buffett yardstick, um, and I can I can pull these up on my site really quick. Um, There's a few things 
that we can look at. The valuation of stocks is extremely high, and it's, this is not a good timing indicator, but it tells you what the potential potential risk is. So this is the value of the stock market to the economy. And you can see that this is the late 60s, not a great time to buy stocks. Early 80s was a great time to buy stocks. Actually, if you flip this upside down, this indicator tells you what stocks are gonna do over the next 10 years. So you can see the red line is the Buffett yardstick. This blue line is the actual 10-year, annualized 10-year return from that point forward. So you can see back here in the, like I said, in the early 80s was a great time to buy stocks. You got 15% a year over the next 10 by just buying the stock market then. Dot-com mania stocks get extremely expensive and you actually lose 2% a year or so uh, buying stocks at that point. Right now we're back to that same valuation where stocks have a negative um, expected return, including dividends for the next 10 years. Um, so that's that's one thing that, you know, from a valuation standpoint, I look at. Then from um, a sentiment standpoint, you look at, for me, margin debt, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith wrote, um, there's probably no better index uh, as to the, to, to the uh, the volume of speculation than margin debt. And this is just nominal margin debt. We can relative, we can make it, put it relative to the, the size of the economy. And you can see in the dot-com mania, margin debt soared relative to the size of the economy, again, prior to the financial crisis. And then very recently, margin debt went to all-time new highs relative to the size of the economy. To me, this says people are speculating um, to, to a great degree. There's a lot of this, 600 over 600 billion dollars leverage to the u.s stock market right now is a potentially bearish sentiment signal um, margin debt and the stock market are very highly correlated and to me an, an interesting chart here is in terms of potential risk in the market i like to look at uh, margin debt as a potential risk indicator because all of this money needs to be paid back at some time so i look at its potential supply coming into the market so it's potential 600 billion dollars of supply coming into the market there's a decent correlation between the three-year return in the stock market and margin debt to GDP. Um, so you look at what happened the last time margin debt to GDP both went to these levels. We had 40, 40% drawdowns, 40, 50% drawdowns. So to me, this level of margin debt suggests the potential risk is another 40% or more drawdown. Uh, and what's the potential reward to long-term investors According to the Buffett yardstick uh, market cap to GDP, it's it's roughly zero. So the reward to risk equation for long term investors is very unattractive at present. OK. All right. Well, we uh, I know we got our poll, which we're going to take a look at in a minute, but we do have a couple of questions. Um, one is what is the whole idea behind your DLTR uh, relative to uh, Macy's Dollar Tree versus Macy's ratio? Um, is it just you know, obviously a much cheaper store versus a more expensive store. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people are going to be shopped when things are good. People are more likely to shop at Macy's. And when things are not so good, they're more likely to shop at the Dollar Tree. And, you know, uh, Macy's is, is you talked about, you know, cyclical versus defensive sectors. This is essentially a defensive retailer versus a, a cyclical retailer. Um, and so to me, that's that's really just the thought process behind it. OK, I mean, maybe it would be more meaningful to have more companies rather than because Macy's could just be doing something very poorly. Uh, Absolutely. And yeah, you could run you could run like discount retailers versus department stores. And, right. And, and also that ratio, you're right, that ratio has soared recently because department stores generally have, have not been doing very, very well. So, you know, that's part of it, too. Yeah. Um, also, where did you find your insider trading data? Where do you get that? Um, there's two sites that I really like. This one that I highlighted uh, is openinsider.com. Um, I, I go to that site every day. And then my friend Asif runs a site called Inside Arbitrage. Insidearbitrage.com. They both have, um, it's totally free to, to go through insider buying and selling on those, on those sites. That's something that I've studied for a long, long time. Uh, insider buying and selling. When you find in insiders that are really good at buying their own stock, and the technicals are lining up and it's cheap. I mean, those, those are always been the greatest opportunities for me. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we have the poll up here. Um, and this was, uh, you know, we, you talked about gold earlier. And I, I think you, it's fair to say that you're bullish gold right now. And so the question was for the viewers, 
uh, given the fact that the dollar has been weak and the price of gold has been going higher, do you believe that gold will break out above 1350 over the next two to three months? And, you know, you and I and Aaron, we were speculating before the show because gold has been bullish that we were speculating the answer would probably be yes. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Do you have any other comments? Well, yeah, I think it's, you know, I, we talked about before we went on the air, I think the dollar is really highly correlated to the, the, the federal deficit. That's one of the fundamental reasons I'm bullish. Widening deficit should be bearish for the dollar. Gold usually trades pretty inverse to the dollar. So that should net net be bullish for gold. Um, and then the other side of it, too, is if the, it looks like the Fed's going to cut in July, that could potentially be cut rates in the midst of kind of these inflationary pressures coming from the trade war. If you have all that, that could be the, the catalyst, um, the kind of uh, the cocktail that would catalyze a, a breakout in the gold price. OK. All right. Well, it has been a pleasure having you on here. I know we'd love to have you back sometime if uh, you wouldn't mind stopping by. I think all of our viewers really um, uh, were intrigued by all the charts that you showed. We do like to give both sides. I mean, I, I talk a lot about how bullish I am the market, but I think it is very important to take a look at both sides and, you know, kind of pick your your battle lines. Let me ask you this to, to wrap up. Is there one thing that would change your bearish stance or would it be the culmination of all of your charts? needing to think. Yeah, it's a it's really a, a time frame issue. I mean, in, in the short run, I think if we were able to break above this 2013-14 area, we've had a kind of a decent oversold signal that could be a short term, you know, bullishness, but longer term for me to have to get really, you know, to, to take off all my hedges and, and be comfortable with that, I would have to see, you know, something that would show me stocks are not as highly overvalued or prone, you know, uh, or there's not that much potential supply represented by margin debt on, on the sidelines. Um, so probably those charts were the ones that would have to be for me longer term to become structurally bullish. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, I do want to thank you again for uh, joining us here on Market Watchers Live. Uh, and Jesse, we would love to get you back sometime if you'd like to, to join us again. I'd be happy to. I'm a huge fan of your work, Tom and Aaron. I read you guys stuff all the time and, and I really appreciate what you do. So yeah, it would, it would be an honor.